That's Nick. And that's Joseph. And today we're here to talk about The Tragedy of Macbeth, which is being released courtesy of A24 and Apple TV, uh, released theatrically on Christmas Day, because it's a very holiday-friendly film, um, 2021, and will be available to stream on Apple TV as of January 14, 2022. Notably, it opened the 2021 New York Film Festival. It is the 19th feature directed by Joel Cohen uh, and his first solo directorial effort, because usually his brother uh, is also... Uh, all directing uh, stars his wife uh, Frances McDormand, of which I believe this is the, the director's end. wife is Frances McDormand. Yeah, oh, I thought. Okay, I feel stupid. I thought the Coen brothers were young no. for some reason. <laughs> no, their first film was 1984's Blood Simple, which also starred Frances. In my head, they're like under forty for some reason, <laughs> and I know that they've done a lot of movies. That's weird. I also think that the uh, Coen brothers are black. No. For some reason. <laughs> Aren't there two black brothers who... The, the Hughes brothers, at a, for a time, Menace to Society. You know what? I'm thinking of the Hughes brothers. I know that the people who did the Menace, of the so Menace to Society didn't do this film, but I think in my mind, I think the Coen brothers are the Hughes brothers. No. no. Uh, the Strategy of Macbeth. It, it took a lot to get Joseph to see this film. Uh, for one, I saw it at the beginning of November at a very early screening and was very taken with it. Uh, and I actually took the time to reread the play, which I haven't done since I was in high school, um, and convinced you to sit down and finally see it. My relationship with Shakespeare is troubled because in high school I did struggle and barely made it through with the help of cliff notes and passing grades. So I've never enjoyed Shakespeare. I have no interest in attempting to better understand the language. I just find it hard. Maybe my style of learning. I don't know. It just, it, it, it's very hard for me to connect the words in English being put together in that order. I just don't get it. I, I you know, Shakespeare is difficult, uh, even if you have read a bit of him. Uh, and it takes some getting used to. And, you know, the first screening I saw of this, I drove, it was like an, an hour in LA traffic and I sat in the DGA and I'm watching this, and right away I'm like, oh, I'm not in the mood for this. But I, I've quickly warmed up to it. I think it's a, a stunningly shot film. I think it's very well performed. Uh, Macbeth is a play, you know, it's known as Shakespeare's cursed play, because uh, historically all the things that have gone wrong in multiple productions. There are, of course, many other film versions. Uh, Orson Welles did a version in the 40s. Um, Akira Kurosawa's Throne of Blood. Um, Polanski... His 1971 version, I think to me personally, prior to this, was kind of the penultimate. Um, Justin Kurtzel directed a, a version with uh, Michael Fassbender and Marion Cotillard a few years ago that I, I'm not crazy about. Um, but if you do like this, I highly recommend uh, Andre Vadia's uh, Siberian Lady Macbeth from 1962. Because what, what I'm getting at, the main focal point for me has and is always Lady Macbeth as my fa one of my favorite Shakespearean characters. So for those like me who don't follow Shakespeare well, I'm going to give a very basic plot summary. Sure. Okay. It's set like a thousand years ago, right? Uh, I believe the year supposedly 1606. Uh, and, oh, 1606. Yeah, and uh, King James the Sixth, who was Scottish, was uh, the king of... The, okay, that's uh, not a thousand years ago, but okay. <laughs> I was mistaken. Okay. All right. So it's about... Okay, Macbeth... And his buddy Banquo mm -hmm. are lords, like Scottish lords. In, okay. in this world, they're called Thanes, but yes. Okay. And they're walking one day, and they meet three witches. And these witches tell them, okay, Macbeth, you're going to be the next king of Scotland, but Banquo, you're going to beget kings, so your descendants will ultimately be kings. Okay. <laughs> Right? Yeah, there's a whole, there's some other details. Okay, but the basic story for people okay. who, like me who don't really care. So, so they get told those two things. So Macbeth writes a letter to his wife telling her what these witches said. And she's like, well, we got to kill the king of Scotland then if you're going to be the next king. So he already had a trip planned. They had a trip planned to go visit the king. So they go. Macbeth kills the king. Then he becomes king. And the bulk of the film is Macbeth being paranoid because the witches said, while you're going to be king, oh boy, he's going to beget 
kings. So something in the milk ain't clean that Macbeth's descendants aren't king. So he decides in order to fix that, he's going to basically kill every damn body. But there is sort of a gag and the gag is Macbeth visits the witches again and they say, oh, basically anyone born of a woman can't hurt you. So now Macbeth is feeling real cocky because who isn't born of a woman? So he's still out here killing folks. But at the end, he comes across the character, which he's already interacted with, Macduff. Mm -hmm. There's an MTV VJ named Macduff. No, her name was Duff. I always think about that. Okay. She was beautiful. Anyway, Macbeth is in front of Macduff and he finds out Macduff was born via cesarean. Mm -hmm. So that means he's not of a woman. Because I guess in this old problematic ass world, you have to be born like passed through the vaginal canal to say that you've been born of a woman. So when Macbeth realizes that Macduff is not born of a woman, he concedes to his fate. Macduff decapitates him and the king's nephew son son actually. oh i was right it you're, was his son right. the king's son malcolm malcolm Prince becomes, Cumberland, yeah. becomes king the end yes and banquo who has been murdered at some point in this his son fleance has survived so well. we assume eventually that boy who's a young boy will become king uh if i had to say what the movie or like this is the movie what the story of macbeth is about it's about ambition. How, how one's ambition can get the best of them. Well, it, it, is it fate or is it ambition based on... Because he was just going about doing what he's supposed to do. Because it opens with Banquo and um, Macbeth have just uh, fought very hard for King Duncan, played by Brendan Gleeson, uh, against Norway. And throughout this skirmish with Norway, they have discovered that the Thane of Cawdor is uh, treasonous. So they... they uh, assassinate the Thane of Cawdor and that's in Denzel Denzel Washington plays Macbeth is given his title and before he's told about that title he sees the witches uh, all played by Catherine Hunter who is also my favorite part of it. What did I like about this movie? Uh, I think it looks really cool. I think the actor playing the three witches her body language Catherine Hunter mm -hmm. is really great because she's kind of like it almost looks like she's contorting her body in many in many points and the way she sits it's almost like a bird and like the way she flutters her arms I think looks really cool she's well uh, they are visually tied to the the crows the murder of crows if you will and I think I even though I struggled with this story, I still, and I don't enjoy it, I think the best part of the, like the best character of this story is Lady Macbeth. Yes. Because she's ruthless. Well, she gets all the best lines, talking about bashing that baby's uh, uh, brains out after plucking it from her nipple. I mean, you know, unsex me here. Oh, I love, I love this scene where she gets the letter and Frances McDormand, as she's reading it and sets it on fire and it, it drifts up into the stars. This makes me think of House of Gucci. Like, this is how that lady... Should have been. Oh like, yeah, yeah, conniving, like, much more conniving. Yeah, like it, yeah. But there, it. My usual problem with Macbeth though is always, it seems that sh Lady Macbeth is the stronger of the two, but then all of a sudden she goes mad as well and kills herself, and there's no, really That's no right. explanation of like, wait, at what point do you go crazy? Is it really bothering you? At what point do you get to out out damn spot? Well, go through your little notes. Um, I really, uh, I was impressed with Denzel quite a bit because. Uh, we often talk about Denzel Washington and how he is uh, the same a lot because he relies on some tics. And I think because of the language, I didn't really see that happening a lot. Uh, sure. And I thought that there's kind of a bizarre chemistry with Denzel and Francis McDormand. Sure. That oddly works, especially even more on a rewatch because I felt a little cold about them at first. Um, I was also impressed with Corey Hawkins. Who, Who's that? He's McDuff. The black man. You know him as playing Dr. Dre in yes, Straight I'm Outta familiar. Compton. Yes. Um, he's uh, going to be in the musical remake of The Color Purple that I believe is... What? Do we know who's he, playing Seeley? I don't know. He's Harpo. Um, anyhow, I was also impressed with him. Another one of my favorite scenes uh, in how it's shot and executed is when uh, Macduff's family is assassinated. 
and his boy is thrown off into that burning pit in the house. Uh, th very striking. Uh, Brendan Gleeson's fine. I, I think the murder scene's <laughs> well done, uh, especially because uh, Brendan Gleeson is uh, positioned in the same way as when Macbeth and Lady Macbeth first meet where she's sleeping and he's sitting over her. Um, when I think of... Because we often, I mean, I've seen many videos and stage plays where someone will recite sh like lines from Shakespeare. Usually people do that like as a monologue. Mm -hmm. And and I know I'll probably get read for this, but I feel like every time I've heard someone do Shakespeare, it sounds the same. I think Like their body language, the posturing, the inflections, it's all the same. So then in this film, it's like, yeah, Denzel's seems different because he's not doing his usual tics, but like, it, it's just a very familiar performance like from everyone like everyone sounds the same and i i think that's because you it it's a foreign it sounds like a foreign language and you don't have the interpreted subtitles and reading shakespeare and listening to shakespeare i think you really have to take a little you have to do a little prep work i think to really get into it which is why i reread it again before watching it and taking the time to read through all the notes about references and changes and and then i think you can really find a legend into the into reading this material and kind of I think falling in love with the way this language was like there's a part in the play where he talks about the stones the the his footsteps the stones gossiping about him because his footsteps are echoing on them um you know obviously a lot of lady Macbeth's what's meant by unsex me uh be don't be the flower be the serpent underneath it there you know there, there's a lot of very poetic language there uh and and of course the rhyme scheme that I think that if you like language and you like this theatricality I the think, style of language yes yes I, but again i think it takes you can't just jump into it I, you would you're lost you without you need a, a life raft so I, I agree with that and i know it's difficult but it's been a very long time since i've seen a shakespearean production that i f i felt this strongly about um the last one i had got you to watch which didn't go well was julie tamor's the tempest in 2010 where uh, Helen I don't Mary. remember that. You, oh, uh, who's the man in it? Russell Brand is in it. Uh, yes. Helen Mirren is Prospero. Uh, I was funky about that one. You were very funky oh. about that. But I agree, I didn't really like that either. But I was so, I didn't vet it for you ahead of time because to me, my f personal favorite uh, filmed uh, version of Shakespeare is Julie Taymor's Titus, which is, of course, based on his least popular play and most violent, Titus Andronicus. Which you said, you said I've seen. You did see, but I don't oh, Jessica Lange is so good as uh, Tamara, Queen of the Goths. Um, and one of the only lines I really have uh, ever memorized from Shakespeare is uh, when she tells her sons, to, she's telling her sons to rape Titus's daughter. And she says, when ye have the honey ye desire, let not this wasp out live us both to sting. Oh, like, I love that. Anyhow, um, this is up there. And Should I be concerned? What's happening? <laughs> Bruno Delbonel shot it, who has uh, done a couple other, has served as cinematographer for a few, a few other Coen Brothers productions, notice, notably also for Jean-Pierre Genet uh, with Amelie and a very long engagement. But really this is, whether or not you like the material or are tired or of the story because you've seen it done so many times before, this is, this was shot on sound stages in Los Angeles, I think it is so gloomy and fantastic. Catherine Hunter as the witches, uh, Francis McDormand as Lady Macbeth, this all the things with the crows. Um, I liked um, Alex Hassel who plays Ross. He's the one with the he's the, got those beautiful big eyes and he's I, lo I love his wardrobe and oh yeah the costuming's nice. He. Um, so Ross, is, having read it, is not a character that stands out to me. And I like that in this, Joel Cohen, what he does is use Ross as weird connective tissues, who's kind of working both sides. Because he's, there, the scene where Banquo is murdered by, uh, at that little outpost where Catherine Hunter is also playing the old man, uh, there is a footnote in the play where suddenly it seems like a third murder comes into the scene that the other two are addressing. And Joel Cohen uh, makes that Ross. Which, which adds a, a weird dimension to this play that I find very interesting. Uh, but, but I liked him a lot. Um, Brian Thompson is one of the murderers of Banquo, who has an immediately recognizable face. But you, uh, he was in, what's that Sylvester Stallone movie, uh, Cobra? Uh, he was also being bred to be this kind of this B-grade, more like 
kind of a Z grade uh, action star. But if you haven't seen Nico Mastoraki's Hired to Kill, starring Oliver Reed, who was you know well into his uh, cirrhosis days, uh, Hired to Kill is a lot of fun. And I know I've showed you parts of that because it's so over the top ridiculous. Uh, Stephen Root uh, has a fun little role as the porter, the one who's drunkenly asleep when Macduff and uh, oh, I recall that. Yeah, yeah like I, I thought he did a good job. I I was just overall impressed with everybody in this. Uh, I like the liberties that it takes. Again, that final shot of the murder of crows across the bleak sunrise. Uh, I don't know. I, I was I was obviously very taken with this film. Um, what uh, the score by Carter uh, Burwell, uh, who also did the score for Fargo and Carol for um, Todd Haynes. Uh, yeah, also really like that. Did you go through all your notes? I believe so. Um, what would you give this film? I would give it four out of five. Wow. Uh, I mean, I feel like I shouldn't rate it because I, you know, it's just not for me and I don't have any feelings about it. But uh, do you know much about the Con or the Hughes brothers? Yeah, we watched quite a few of the Hughes brothers. They actually Could you name some films? Uh, Menace to Society, Dead Presidents, um, From Hell with Johnny Depp. Uh, oh. The last film they directed together was The Book of Eli with Denzeli. Oh. But they have both gone on to do different things uh, on their own. Broken City was... It's Albert and Alan are their, are their names. I'd have to look up. Um, one of them is doing something very interesting. Well, shout out to the Hughes brothers. Oh, yeah. I mean, they're the landmark of 90s cinema. Do you have anything else? Uh, no, that's it. Listen to our podcast. The link is below. Bye. Bye. Thank you.